And the reading for today is this, I think, sort of a nice transition. It's dealing with the Maya and um, both ancient to contemporary um, cacao farming habits and, and uses of cacao. And again, um, those authors do a good job of emphasizing these sort of rituals, the different kinds of rituals that cacao is used for, that it's linked with political power, um, that and those inscriptions on different sorts of vessels and things, that the, the evidence that they had of cacao use in that area of Belize. And, um, <coughs> And moving along with that, um, yeah, and again, here's one of those Maya, ancient Maya books that, that talks about kind of these every day. So the, the, the rituals that um, Patricia McEnany um, talks about in that, that chapter, that book chapter, are uh, some of them are marriages, so it's sort of everyday things, just like this almanac is. And then some of them are very, um, are a little bit more special, but, um, and then, again, I wanted to emphasize that um, it's not just the Maya, because we're re reading a lot about the Maya, right? And the cooking technology, and um, in some ways, I think it's the Nahuas, the Aztecs and the related people who are the key cacao, and eventually chocolate. We'll get to chocolate today, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, and as I mentioned last time, and you can probably, you can actually view this whole book. This is um, called the Florentine Codex, and the facsimile of it is online. It's a high resolution um, digital book, and you can look at these pages, just like I put up here. Um, but it has these great illustrations of these women selling in the marketplace um, different products. And they have, what, different, again, thinking about the technology and how we can um, understand things just by looking at the technology, different shaped vessels, right? And, and what are they sitting on, these, these kind of open air cars, too? Um, they're not going to use a Mayan name for it, but, um, but they're serving these hot foods. Um, and again, it's um, an adventure in poetics. I'll just read the first couple words. This is, so, oh, and explaining this too. So it's all handwritten, right? This was done in the 16th century. Um, and this side, yeah, this side is in Spanish, written in Spanish. This slide is written in Nahuatl. So that this is the language of the Aztecs and also the language of people living in um, coastal Mexico on the base of the Gulf Coast there and, um, and on into El Salvador. And in fact, you know, Nicaragua, that name, comes from the name Nicarao and Nicaraos were uh, Nahuatl speakers. So at a certain point, and that's part of what my archaeological work was looking at, people who spoke Nawa moved that far south um, and did a lot of stuff there. But anyway, this is written in Nawa. And so you have this interesting thing about translation <coughs> and who, who wrote each side and, and how they, they bothered to translate it. So on the Nawa side, it's beautiful poetry. I mean like stunning, especially in this section. And I won't read the whole thing because it would take too long and my not what's bad. Um, starts So it's playing. Like you hear these same sounds and word parts and it's just changing little bits. And it builds the whole thing like that, the whole, this whole passage. And remember last time I talked about how the, the woman selling, and it's a woman, um, in the marketplace selling um, cacao beverages is called the Atakitsali. That's where that word's coming in. The seller of fine cacao. This is the English translation of the Spanish side. 
the seller, well, actually, of the novel, it's um, The seller of fine cacao. The seller of fine cacao is one who grinds, who provides people with drink, with repasts. She grinds cacao seeds. She crushes, breaks, pulverizes them. She chooses, selects, separates them. She drenches, soaks, steeps them. She adds water sparingly, conservatively, aerates it, filters it, strains it, pours it back and forth. She makes it form a head, makes it foam. She removes the head, makes it thicken, makes it dry, pours water in, stirs water into it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Right? <laughs> and you thought it was fancy at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what this that's what this section about here to here. Yeah. Okay. Well I should just turn here. Um so yeah. So all of those steps, all of that selection. Um so and that's to prepare and serve, right? Does it talk about what is it? What, are, what is she adding to the cacao? So she's selecting the cacao. What else has she added to it? Water. Water. Doesn't talk about anything else, really. So, interesting. Um, and then there are other um, sections in the same book that talk about. Um, I don't have the pages pulled up. Um, the the uh, beverages served to the Aztec king and talk about its green, and this is again an English translation, green made up of tender cacao, honeyed chocolate or cacao beverage made with ground up dried flowers with green vanilla pods, bright red chocolate, <coughs> orange colored cacao, oh, I'm using their translation, oh. um, black cacao, white cacao. So the same one in a different spot is talking about all of these different states of the cacao ingredients. What is that? Plumbing's gone bad. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> it's in the same, you know, it's, it's, so it's written by the same person, yeah. Um, is there something that maybe she added to thicken it? Like, how is it that she thickens it? Well, that's a good question because um, there are some, you know, the implication is with all the different steps that it's describing that she's l letting it dry and then she's adding it back in the right amount of liquid and that that process changes how, how thick it is. Um, so just... I think of things like uh, cooking techniques like um, reductions where you, you reduce it down and it makes it thicker. Um, there's no, you know, there, there's not a statement like adding egg or adding other cream or any, any sort of thickener like that. Um, so that it's just that um, tiny, yeah. She's like whipping air into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so that's, that's creating that froth and foam. And you might recall that uh, the wild patashte is supposed, you know, some people think that it actually makes a better, like a thicker foam um, than the uh, theobroma cacao. So um, things that we, uh, you know, in future generations of the class, I'd love to ex experiment with, you know, let's, let's whip this up. Let's see, what <laughs> let's see how it goes. Um, so. There's all these things. So, and, and then there are ingredients listed in other places. The word, absolutely, that's never used anywhere in the Spanish or anywhere in the Nahuatl is the word chocolate. Nowhere. This whole book talks lots and lots about cacao in different places. So it's cacao beverage, and that's why I was messing up when I was reading um, what's been printed as a translation of the Nahuatl and other, other uh, 
by other people because they, they, they change it into chocolate. Um, but you know, but you can see, like all the stuff that I showed last time, lots of different um, um, tastes and flavors and preparations, gruels, all that sort of thing, and the, the classic Maya text. This one, all, you know, again, all this, this um, emphasis on different sorts of flavorings and uses, and then all of the different ethnographic examples that we have from different places in the Maya area, in the readings. There's lots of different ways to um, do things, enjoy, and experience chocolate, uh, cacao. So where does chocolate show up? And what is it? Um, oops, wrong one. The oldest reference in colonial writing, there aren't any pre-Columbian texts that have been translated that can be read as chocola. Yeah. Um, but it's this um, inscription. It was, it's, it's a part of correspondence relating to um, colonial Guatemala, which that region where I worked in El Salvador was part of colonial Guatemala at the time. Um, and there so this earliest reference, this is the Spanish on the side, from my very dowry. So again, the thing about wealth, this is like an item of wealth getting ready to be married. So again, it's that sort of marriage and social connection. I bring you in a gourd vessel. So this word, tecomate, refers to this kind <coughs> of shaped vessel. Remember the, some of the things I show, the very old examples, ancient examples are sort of those rounded, phytoform, and especially this one has that sort of modeling on the side that makes you think of it. And a gourd vessel that is cacao and achiote, para hacer chocolate, to make chocolate. Ah, there's the word, finally. <laughs> So what is, do, do y'all know what achiote is? Anybody, anybody heard of it before? An, anato? It's, it's something, and so I've got something to pass around. First time, I've talked about this a lot of times, and I usually forget to bring examples with me. And like all of the newer preparations that are, are like ancient, chocolate or whatever recipe, and they never put this in it. Um, but you can sniff it, and I poured a little bit out so you can see the color better. If you're really excited, you can, you know, mm -hmm. dip your finger in it and taste it. Um, I use it, and it's used in uh, Mexican and Central American cooking. It gives a lot of color to things. Yeah, yeah, often, oftentimes it is. But it doesn't it doesn't have a strong flavor and that's why it's a good it's a good colorant. I was gonna say you probably have had some anato, some achiote. If you had anything that was sort of pinkish or, you know, like strawberry flavored, but where does the pink color come from? It's it's it used to now, um, some companies got into trouble because they were using another um, colorant for foods that uh, comes from bugs, um, cochineal. And in fact, I think Starbucks had a strawberry shake or something that they colored with cochineal. And people got outraged, and said, oh my god, we're eating bugs. Well, yeah, you are, but <laughs> I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> Um, but that cochineal also has this uh, really fantastic history. Um, and in fact, that would be a great food muse sort of thing to do with color and food. But, um, but this one, and, and what's interesting is that the um, chocolate, first of all, all the first references to chocolate, not just not cacao in general, but chocolate itself, that exact word, 
um, associated with Guatemala, with colonial Guatemala. So they, they say, it comes from there, it's known by that, uh, you know, it's known for this particular cacao preparation. And in fact, there's this um, uh, British royal physician who in the um, 1600s was writing about, well, chocolate is to Guatemala as ale is to England. You know? <laughs> it's just like, that's the spot, that's where it's from. And uh, so you see that really strongly connected. Um, and, and there's a whole story about, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, doesn't coffee also come from Guatemala or Brazil? It does no. now. It does I'm now. From Guatemala. I thought it said there were like big coffees. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it made a, uh, an incredible change in the economy and ecology of those coffee producing areas. But that's, you know, a, a fairly late, more recent thing. Mm. It's, it's really from the Middle East. Oh. Yeah, it starts out there and then it spreads to other places. And, and it, um, a coffee can tolerate a little more cold than cacao that it does, but they grow in similar sorts of situations. Um, okay, so there's there's the, the recipe. And here's the achiote, what the plant looks like. So um, it, you know, you think of it like a cocklebur or weed or something, but, but they grew it and for, for seasonings, for colorings, for food, um, it appears in other sorts of um, recipes and things. And, you know, it's not just for chocolate. Um, but basically, you take that, the little seeds on the inside, and grind them up and it make it into a paste like this. Yeah. And you can buy, this is a nice example, where you can buy like, cakes of it in um, Central American markets, even today. So, what a difference. Um, now, what are some of the other sorts of cacao flavorings that, like, that when uh, the Florentine Codex mentions other sorts of sources around the same time. Well, some are these things um, uh, called ear flour. This is actually a very common, like 16th century ingredient in, in um, cacao beverages. Um, these things um, that are the fruit, a nano fruit, um, I don't have a picture of it, but it has a very mild flavor, a lot like the cacao fruit does. And there are records of adding that to um, different preparations. Um, and other sorts of, other, uh, this is even called in Spanish, rosita de cacao. It's, you know, it's so associated with putting with cacao that um, in preparations, that they, you know, it's like a, it's not a flower of cacao. It's something that just like goes with it, like peanut butter and jelly, you know those two things. What was a real peanut butter and jelly? Vanilla. Like, it's, yeah, chocolate and vanilla, always together in these, these colonial, early, early, early recipes, the first records that we have. Um, and, and yeah, we call one thing chocolate, and that's a Nahuatl word. I mean, we're pretty much, haven't translated translated it at all. You can think of other foods. When you think about um, linguistics, like the anthropology in terms of linguistics related to this food item, for whatever reason, we have not changed it. Any language. I'm still looking, but I have not found an example. It's always some form, the closest thing that the language can make to chocolate. What's the now what name for the thing that often went with it, uh, vanilla, which is not an everyday word, right? <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, so you can think about these different sorts of recipes and that, um, as maybe the cacao itself had its own flavor profile. Maybe it's enhanced by adding these ingredients, or maybe they just wanted a particular taste and they added these different ingredients pretty consistently. Um, and then out of that, and this is just an example from my research of all the different um, ingredients that are found in different cacao beverage descriptions um, from lots of different sources. And, they're, um, and these are all related, you know, uh, identified with parts of Guatemala, Mexico, <coughs> that sort of thing. And so you see a lot of other things that do come in, like in the new, new versions of chocolate bars that have that are supposed to be ancient recipes. Um, spicy. So, um, sp spicy piquant, like uh, different sorts of chili. Um, flowery, nut starchy. Remember the, the ancient Maya ones that had corn and things in it? Well, the Europeans bring over things like almonds and hazelnuts. It's like, hey, yeah, that sounds good. We'll do that too. <laughs> and, um, and then sweeteners. Um, once sugar hits the scene, it's taken up as a sweetener. It's not the only sweetener. You know, there's still recipes with honey in it and other sorts of sweeteners, but um, um, yeah. Okay. So, it's that one that, it's the Anona. Um, um, it's, it's, it's one of those tropical fruits that I don't, you can look it up, uh, I, well, I don't, I don't have images of it right here, but it's got um, green, it looks like a, almost like an avocado, the, the, and they sell them in the markets here, like in the grocery store. You'll see um, Anona, sometimes it, it, it's where they put all the weird fruits, <laughs> you know what I mean, like the things that, you know, um, things like star fruit even, and, 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 and you know, just exotic fruit, and you'll see a nona in there um, fairly, fairly often, um, or with the sort of Latin American tropical things. Um, okay, and so this is an example from coffee, but a uh, flavor wheel. And you can think about all those different flavors that go into, this is describing, this is the fine co coffee industry. So, um, you know, uh, uh, coffee ground by a particular grower and how to grade it and evaluate it. And these are the different sort of flavor notes to think about. But you can do the same thing with cacao itself or with um, the chocolate that's produced from it. Um, okay. So, when we, that's the end of, I wanted to finish up that part of the story. And then today, really um, think about all of the steps that go in to creating this, these different products, but especially thinking about the agriculture and the technology that's part of the agriculture and those first initial steps and what an effect it has um, on, on, on cacao. And you can think about it in terms of other, other examples. Um, every day, you know, I get, people send me stuff, not every day, but um, quite often people will send me news reports and things come out about um, cacao fairly often. And this is a story that the BBC ran today about um, a f this uh, I initiative in the Philippines where people are, oh, quit, are shifting to cacao agriculture um, and, you know, thriving from that. Like the, the, the agribusiness of it um, is beneficial in that um, it, with those human environment interactions, they're already growing coconuts 
and they're not making a huge amount of money off of coconuts. Um, but if you intercrop cacao with coconuts, the production of the coconuts goes up. And then, uh, then there, and he talks about, and there's a, this is an embedded video file in this, um, and I have all the links in my PowerPoint. Um, he, talks, uh, he talked about, well, I just started out planting a few trees, and I thought it might you know, give me a little bit of extra income, and then he realized the kind of larger effects of, of uh, diversifying and, and changing its uh, agricultural practices. Um, and, and now it's really the cacao that's um, made him fairly well off and, and uh, really sparked a lot of interest in cacao agriculture. So it you know, brings to me, to my mind, issues about um, technology change. Remember that sort of general scheme of forager, um, pastoralist, horticulture, agriculture, intensive agriculture. But where does cacao fit in all of that? And, I'm, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, definitely it's in the horticulture, agricultural side of things. Um, but what all goes into it and what evidence do we have of it over time? And, um, how, you know, how, what are some different clues and, you know, how can we observe cacao and sort of figure out some of these um, bigger anthropological issues? So, I'm going to take you through steps. And I've got little videos and things of people doing the steps. Um, and we can think about this issue of, remember horticulture, simple tools, small plots of land, human power, um, and uses domesticated plants. So I think, you know, most of the time, it fits pretty well with um, horticulture. And that's related with these, these uh, you know, sedentary, larger populations. And, and you can think about how much cacao is part of the diet in different ways in the examples that we have. Um, and then that whole issue about whether it increases or decreases diversity. Whereas intensive agriculture, large scale cultivation, big terracing, um, using usually some sort of assistance through um, um, draft animals or um, in more recent times, um, different sorts of um, tractors and things like that. Uh, and then this other thing about fertilization to kind of keep you know, a big area under cultivation for as long as possible. Um, so very different sorts of effects on the environment um, compared to horticulture in some way. Um, and then, we hadn't gotten this far before, with intensive agriculturalists, like with horticulture, horticultural societies, you have a much bigger population. <coughs> intensive agriculture tends to be associated with the biggest populations. Um, and so it's in relationship quite often with the growth of urbanism. You have cities and you have the productive capacity and, and food to feed those cities. So, so again, big, big environmental changes going on. Um, and then it implies all of that very complex sort of systems, political organization systems, economic systems, that sort of thing, um, social hierarchies, and how they come out, come into play, especially in managing labor. Okay, so getting back to cacao. So keep those issues in mind about um, intensive agriculture versus horticulture. Um, as I mentioned before, with just harvesting the cacao, fruit. It's a tropical plant, so, and the, the funny thing about a cacao tree is that it blooms and has fruit at the same time, so it's not like it blooms, then it, only one time, it all, that all produces fruit, 
you harvest that, and then it goes through another cycle. Now it's kind of always going on all the time, um, but there's a big surge <coughs> of production, I guess you'd say. Um, this is the best way to talk about it. Five or six months after the rainy season starts in these tropical areas. And so the main harvest times, and it goes over several months, um, depends on you know the local conditions. And also this two main harvest thing, um, and looking at colonial records, some of it had to do with when taxes were due. You know, I mean, okay, it's Christmas time, you gotta, you know, pay up to the state. <laughs> we're gonna have our big cacao harvest so you can manage to pay all that off. Um, so it, it really did coincide in Central America, at least, with different uh, two major feast days and um, kind of time when, when you had to make good with, with the colonial powers. Um, another example, like in in Africa and Ivory Coast and Ghana, October to March um, are the main season, main harvest, and then uh, like a smaller harvest in mid August. So the big thing is the pod needs to be ripe. So they start out green and they ripen to yellow, orange, red. I love this picture of her. Uh, so many, you know, and keep in mind, a lot of the pictures that you can get are staged. You know, they're they're pretty pictures, um, and that was true of a lot of the videos too. Even ones where they tried to look casual. Hey, you drying your cacao beans today? Yeah, I sure am. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, I like footage that's just sort of raw footage of people doing stuff. But anyway. It's not like, I don't even know if you can pick papayas like this. It's not like you pluck the fruit from the tree and put it, you know, it's almost a, quite a romantic image that's in here. Um, no. <laughs> These are domesticated plants, right? Patash day, the fruit falls to the, the forest floor. It, you don't have to cut it off. Part of the domestication process here. This is, you know, it's telling us this. The plant is, is, you know, this is what people selected for. You gotta cut it off. And part of the pickiness of cacao, you can't cut it off just any old way. You can't take it like a machete and wail at the, the <laughs> tree. You know, no. Because what that does is it damages where the flowers are gonna come out next. So. You mess this up, you're, you're really going to decrease your production. Um, so, pod has to be ripe, so there's some judgment in that, and then it's cut from the tree by hand. And here's a little video showing that. Yeah, is there sound? Now. Yeah, there you go. Why is there no sound? That's sad. Hmm. Probably with your toolbar at the bottom. Yeah, thank you. Um. Oh. Hang on. <coughs> there we go. Ah, thank you. It's just the mood music. -y. Some of these have like slow jams that they start out the. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a happy new tropical tune. Some people don't like cows. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so the, the outer shell of the paw is hard, not, not soft like the papaya. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. It's not that. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> you just have to take it, right? Get back to this. Yeah. So, um, let me see what else is on here. I'm sorry. Let me get this back. For an average pod, mm -hmm. how many chocolate bars will one average pod have? Oh, yeah. you know what? I don't have in my head how many seeds to it takes to make a bar. We'll figure that out. I'll be good thing. Uh, per pod, I was hoping you were going to ask, it's usually 35 to 50 seeds. So we can do it. We can figure out. And then they're about um, in a pound of a, a pound of cacao seeds is about um, 400 400 seeds per pound. And then it's uh, and then I'll, I'll show you. It kind of varies um, how much you get out per seed too. Okay, so we cut um, those pods you take and you, so that's the first part of the selection process is you sort them. You know, you saw the guy just kind of going through and chopping them up. And, um, and the fruit is the, the sort of fleshy part that's part of the rind is, is not necessarily used. Um, and, and definitely the rind itself. Um, uh, yeah, 50 beans or so. Um, and then, then you saw that the color, what color was the, were the seeds? White. Yeah, they can be very white, kind of purplish, lavender colored sometimes. Um, now, so here's another question too. If you're a grower, what of those seeds do you want to take and plant and to make more cacao trees? And what do you want to take and, and process to eat? Um, and you have different storage lengths that you can you can store you can store the harvested pod evidently for about a week and still be able to plant the seeds. Um, but I think they probably get lucky by then. Um, and the ones that are best for planting are from the middle of the pod. And so there are lots of great pictures. This is actually sorting the, the seeds themselves. Um, Remember the Trinitario um, bride? Yeah. Is it kind of like, you know, like when you're hollowing out a pumpkin, does it that goofy stuff? Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'll, yeah, a fair bit like that, except it's even more like together. It's like if the pumpkin were totally full when you open it. You know how it's kind of hollowed out inside? Now, this is totally, it's full of that. And so it's pulling out that. Um, and you saw how they just sort of put it in some sort of leaves or uh, usually basket or something like that. Um, and then that's important for the next stage, uh, which is this fermenting. And I'll show you an example. So this is unfermented, somewhat fermented to fully fermented. That shows the whole scale there. Um, and this is in Guatemala by um, some footage shot by the people from Madre Cacao, which are nice, uh, chocolate producers. And so you see a wooden box. This is the fermentation chamber on for the cacao that Don Tito made, and he's showing us that he's replaced it with uh, banana leaves on top to uh, keep the heat in. Ah, eh, ¿Cuántos días está ya aquí? Es calenta mucho, ¿no? Cuatro días. Cuatro días. Sí. Four days. It's really hot inside. It's like uh, over probably 130 degrees Celsius. Ah, uh, Fahrenheit. Yes, <laughs> 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 it's pretty flaming. Oh. <laughs> it gets hot out. 130. So they're still kind of they're wet, right? There's a lot of moisture in the seeds. Does it smell bad? It smells like 
Ah, sí, esa. Not like a, have you been to a brewery or anything? Así, <laughs> así calor. That's a happy smell. This is a chocolatey, <laughs> fruity, yeah. Es natural. Sí, sí. Orgánico también, ¿no? And here we are in the beautiful town of Santa Cecilia on the hills next to the Nancy trees. Nancy is a kind of beautiful fruit. hibiscus. Um, okay. It's a great setting for the cacao to grow. Okay. Um, and so, what does this do? So, you've got all this goop around it. It all, you put it in some kind of container, and I'll show you another example where it varies quite a bit. Um, and it keeps that seed from, it kills the germination process, because it gets so hot. Um, all of that sort of, the, and they call it, talk about it as sweating, like it, it, start, it gets drippy. Um, you can use <coughs> that fermented pulp stuff that's coming off the liquid, and that's the beginnings of a cacao wine. Um, so people will definitely do that. And um, the cacao wine, like in uh, West Africa, that's a common sort of thing. And they sell it locally. They produce it locally. They consume it locally. It's not exported. Um, but what's exported are the seeds, of course. Um, and it gets very, it naturally gets very hot. You just put it together, it starts that whole fermentation, and fermentation is a chemical process that produces heat um, because it's turning sugar into alcohol, right? Um, and, and it, so it changes the way the seed looks, and it changes the way it is on the inside. Um, and this is really a crucial thing as far as um, the flavor, the final flavor that occurs with it. Um, you under ferment. What happens when you have something like that's a little bit damp and it sits around? Mm -hmm. Moldy. Yeah, moldy. Mm. Um, <laughs> and what are some other things? So you can have mold. You over ferment and it, it also gets gross on the other end. Like it's just over bad, there are bad flavors that creep into it. Um, there's a point um, where you can have very, uh, these sort of flowery, citrusy, all these subtle flavors. If you ferment it just right, it will come out. Um, ferment it a little bit long. Like you, you can be sure it's fermented. That's a, like a pure chocolate flavor. That's just the chocolatey chocolate, no extra, nothing fancy. Um, and so people play with those fermentation times. And you can tell it's this matter of judgment. And it's also a matter of it getting the prop, having the proper amount of heat for the right amount of time. And I can tell you there's no, even though this is all very scientific, there's really no set way it's the one right way. And it's a lot of playing with, because where was he? Where was the <coughs> fermentation thing? The container. It's outside. Most of this is outside. Some of it's inside. So if it's climate controlled, is that better? I don't know. Humidity. You know, what are some other things that, just looking at that, you think might affect? Bugs. Yeah. Bugs could get in it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What world was he using? I don't know. I, did, I you know I don't know for that particular container. You know, and so wood even versus metal containers um, versus baskets or other sorts of things. Like they could all. And then the topper too. You know, some some places that are, and I think this is more so true for industrial cacao production, just put plastic sheeting on top. You know, you just put the plastic on there and it holds the heat in, you're good. The, um, there are some interesting studies that look at even the banana leaves, and for good fermentation to happen, like have a stable fermentation environment, 
you actually have to have a certain amount of bacteria. And so those leaves are actually introducing bacteria. People putting their hands in there and moving stuff around and checking on things, it's introducing bacteria. You need it. It's like, it's like the good stuff in your gut and all that sort of thing. You've got to have it. But you can think about where those sources are coming from and, um, and how that's going to affect flavor as well. Yeah. Do they like rinse off the white film at all or do they just throw it all in the... It all drips out. It all drips. All. And so you end up... So all they did was put those white slimy things in that bin. And, and then covered it, and then it ends up after four days looking like that, where it's mostly the seeds still sitting there. Um, here's another example. Oh yeah, underdone, flavor similar to raw potatoes, yum. That's my favorite. Such music. This is sort of a longer Vietnamese so there's some of the stuff. Some very nice cacao coming out of Vietnam now. You can think of the.
và tới cây này đã kết thúc cái cái chúng ta sẽ đổ phơi thì chúng tôi sẽ đo lại cái nhiệt cho bà con xem cái nhiệt độ như thế nào còn cái hạt hiện nay thì bà con thấy cái mầm đó nó bị phân hủy cái mầm và những cái nếp răng của hạt bắt đầu nó, nó, nó rõ nét và cái nhiệt nhảy xuất hiện đây là cái, cái quy trình lên men rất là tốt cho cái hạt cà ca vinegar à. và khi bà con ngửi thì cái mùi cái mùi này nó có hơi mùi dốc mùi khai mùi lắm là lại cái mùi đã đã đạt nếu mà chúng ta ủ thêm thì nó sẽ sau khi 5 ngày thì bà con thấy ủ quy trình 5 ngày thì bà con thấy nhiệt độ bắt đầu nó giảm nó giảm khoảng khoảng 44 đến 45 độ thì quy trình bắt đầu nó đã từ từ nó giảm dần thì chúng ta sẽ cho cái thùng ủ ra, ra phơi như vậy là mới đạt nếu mà chúng ta kéo dài nữa thì không không nên tại vì nếu chúng ta kéo dài nữa thì nhiệt cũng không lên nữa và ok uh, and you can watch the rest of the The, the links in the PowerPoint. You can watch the rest of the video there. Um, so somewhere between three and five days, I've seen in some cases like as long as a week. And so how, what kind of tech, do you need those temperature monitors to tell you? Oh, this is like, stick your hand in, man, that's hot. Okay, <laughs> let's cut the thing open. Eh? Yeah, no, it's permit. No, it's not, you know, it's not done yet. Um, and they look, you know, so not every, the, uh, ev evidently, you can't wait for every single seed in there to be perfectly fermented, but if you get about half, then, then it's probably good. Um, I don't think it's acceptable. Um, yeah. And then after that, this one's a very short one. It's cute. Um, the drying. This is like a big, this is in West Africa. This is not a big, I mean, so you have it out on some sort of tray. And that gives it a flavor too. Okay, that's good. So how much high tech evidence is there? How much of this is that they're doing is high tech? Yeah. What is the technology? What are the main technologies you've seen so far? Containers. Yeah, containers. Yeah, but some you know you could. Yeah, so cutting implements though, right? Cutting in implements, some sort of container, the space. So this, when you dry it, you can't have it in a box. You gotta, you gotta spread it out and you gotta move it around. Um, so all of those things would be, so where's the, where's the, like the, the real investment is in the skills of observation and skills of evaluation. Um, picking the, the fruit at the right stage, um, fermenting it the right amount of time, um, paying attention to it while it's drying. Now there are some cases, um, at the, this one chocolate um, festival I went to, they showed examples of people drying cacao on the asphalt. Because, you know, it's hot, it's open space, it, you know. But again, it'll give flavor. Mmm, <laughs> that tar. No. <laughs> um, and there are these days some people do <coughs> mechanical drying. Um, you know, use dryers and, and what. But um, generally, the results seem to be a little bit better with sun drying. Um, so you go from about. 55 to 69 percent moisture, and all of it drips and dries and everything to 6 to 7 percent. Um, and then there's a lot of evaluation of sorting out the stuff, like the stuff, the, the seeds that you actually want versus the ones that are hollow um, and so forth. And this is from, yeah, 1565, and what is it showing? The cacao out drying in the sun, the, the, the seeds. Um, person hanging out. 
Oh yeah, and then the other thing you can think after it's dry, where it's stored, how it's stored, what kind of bags, and where it's stored. So again, it's a lot of it has to do with managing space. Um, and then, okay, finally, oh yes, um, we'll do a little cut test here. So inside, the thing that we actually use, <coughs> there's a shell on the outside, and then there are these little bits inside that are, this is like a fermenting, um, that are the nibs, and that's what you make the chocolate with. Some people talk about how you can't use the shells for anything, but um, now a more recent development, and, and it evidently um, during the depression, this actually was fairly common, you can make teas with it. This actually tastes pretty good. Um, but again, you can't have, it's part of it's the pesticide. You can't use a shell. good uses for these byproducts. That's, that's true of the pod shells too. You know, the exterior of that is a big fertilizer. Um, and that's probably part of why the production of the coconuts goes up. Because you know, we have these other products that are enriching the environment. Um, um, and the nibs have the cocoa butter as part of it, and if there's a process, then you can extract the, the cocoa butter from it. And we'll talk about that with the process and the consuming. Yeah. I've seen lots of recipes that have cacao nibs in them. Uh -huh. Is the like the health benefit different with an nibs than it would be for like dark chocolate? Well, it's just pure. It's yeah. just the pure cacao mm -hmm. um, versus the dark chocolate has um, other other ingredients in it. Okay, so. Um, and this also, when you cut it open, it's a way of evaluating. We already saw that in the video, you know, whether it's fully fermented or not, um, and fully brown. And so a lot of it has to do with um, color, judging color. And so here's an example of this chart, of this guideline, and then looking at the colors of the, of the um, beans through what's called the cut test. And so for this last part, um, just come come up here. I'm gonna put the seeds out on this table. Um, I've done this before. I actually tried to cut one myself. I've done the fermenting, like I've had my own um, pods and done parts of it. But now, with all this in mind, um, come and gather around here. You can try it. So on this one side is, and I want you to see the inside. So this is Madagascar versus Ghana. And, and here's the thing, this is, technology. this is hard to do. Um, so I don't cut myself. You need like a guillotine, I'm not kidding, they call them guillotine. Um,
These now and look at the outside of the beans. You can. Um, it's pretty dark. A little bit. Uh, I think this is bad. <laughs> you don't you don't recommend it. <laughs> but but see if you break it like that. Um, so what's another technology that's gonna be important in getting the stuff that you make chocolate out of? What's this issue here? Went away. Where do you get the butter from? From the nib. Oh, you just they extract it. It's, it's, it, yeah, you extract it from them. So it has um, like 40 or 55 percent uh, cocoa butter in there. Anybody else want to cut? Want to try it in? It's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> cut things in half. It's harder than you think. Yeah, I put a little effort into it, so uh -huh. it's not, it's not, not easy. Oh, yeah, go for it. Kind of like do you do it like horizontally or vertically? Well, for the cut test, you can you can cut it the other way if you want. Because um, you want to so have that inside showing the Yeah. Try again. How do you do that? Do you just like well, you have to break it. Pistachio or something? <laughs> you have to break it. So the shell is really thin. Yeah. The outer and then that's the oh, okay. That's like literally top. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's a nip shell. Oh, that's good. See, I have the shell. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the nip shell is good. Uh-huh. So you're from Yeah. And that's for nothing. You know, this is like, like, with a little coffee flavor. Yeah. That's not really good. Yeah. We all have to have a separate. Yeah. You can have, um, uh, I outlined it. You can have a recipe, you can have a technique, like even when I say color, some, um, you could easily do color and food and um, kind of pull out different examples along the way. And uh, a method, like if you're really into grilling and you want to see them follow that through. I'm trying to think of stuff that I'll be able to use the whole semester and like what we use specific or, but I guess I just need to check it. Yeah, just yeah. read it through, think about it, and um, and then if you're unsure, you know, email will help you think about it. Because yeah. if it's too narrow, then it's, it's usually a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Per week. I think I'm going to do that for you. Yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, what I can do is I can open it up. Yeah, I'll put it on the table. Yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome class. Oh, thank you. <laughs>